Will security tokens trigger the next bull run? Or will it be institutional money? Will Bitcoin someday replace gold as a digital store of value? What about Ether? Is its price going to eventually trend to zero, or is it going to return to its previous peak? Those are just a few of the fascinating topics we'll be covering in this video. Hi, I'm Tom from Crypto Gurus, and if you want to learn more, keep watching. First up, the disclaimer. Nothing in this video is financial advice. Please pause the video now and read the disclaimer in full. This video is part two of my interview with Pierce Ridyard, the CEO of Radix. We'll be discussing security tokens and institutional money with a particular focus on what could trigger the next bull run. If you haven't already seen part one, the link is in the description, so make sure you check it out. Without any further ado, let's begin with the interview. Uh, let's talk about the next cycle. So in crypto, I've personally only been involved in, with one cycle, but I know you've been around in crypto for longer. You've seen many of these boom-bust cycles that we've had in the past. Yeah. Uh, there's usually a trigger for something like this. Like you see the ICO, the ICO mania. You yeah. Can, you could say that caused the last bull run. Yeah. Looking back to 2013, there was a lot of speculation about Bitcoin suddenly becoming a used digital currency yeah. until the Mt. Gox hack occurred. Yeah. Do you believe we're going to go through another cycle? Yes. And, okay, uh, good firm answer. What's going to cause it? SEOs. Like, SEOs. Without, without a doubt. Like, it's just like, it's just the next run. Like, what you what, what we have had is is a lot of institutional investors standing on the sidelines going, this looks kind of interesting, yeah. but I don't fundamentally understand the instruments. And instrument. they can't value it. No, I can't value yeah. it. Where's my, where's my discounted cash flow yeah. forecast? Where's, where's, where's the revenue stream of the underlying business? Where's my ownership yes. of the underlying mm -hmm. business? SEOs have all of the goodness of instant liquidity and tradability and all that kind of stuff, but institutions understand it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that what you're going to see is probably a, I'm going to say a mid-market boom, right, mm -hmm. where companies that haven't listed on stock markets because they're too small mm -hmm. and the cost of it is too much are going to go, hey, this is a really good way of raising money in public markets. And what we've had in the crypto market so far is businesses have zero revenue, zero customers, and have still had incredible valuations mm -hmm. are going to move out and you're going to have companies that have real customers real revenue and have been running for a few years now coming in and going okay i'm going to tokenize my equity i'm going to tokenize my debt and suddenly those are going to look really really good mm -hmm. to a lot of the investors who have been used to zero zero revenue zero customer businesses and so you're going to see a secondary a secondary boom around those kind of businesses coming in and being tokenized and tokenized in a regulatory compliant way. Absolutely, I completely agree. How's that going to affect the current market though? Like you might take a project with a utility token now and if we talked about a bull run mm -hmm. with massive correlations in the market, yeah. the assumption is that all projects do well. That's yes. kind of what we see. Everything yes. does badly, everything yes. does poorly. Yes. With STOs, they are totally different to ICOs. Like it's, as you say, it's a security token which means you can value it, you can understand it, and institutions will favor it, yes. essentially. How do you think that's going to affect the current market in terms of the current projects? Do you think they're going to be left behind? Or do you think we're going to see strong correlations still exist and the whole market move up as one? Uh, strong correlations will still exist. Like The crypto market fundamentally is, someone said, 97% privately held yeah. rather than institutionally yeah. held, which is which is crazy. Yeah. Um, your, 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 your market is partially fundamentals driven, partially sentiment driven. Mm -hmm. And this market is still, like, I mean, with no fundamentals, it is an entirely sentiments driven market. Mm -hmm. As fundamentals Absolutely. come in and companies that have real revenue, real customers have more fundamentals, that's still going to form part of it. Mm -hmm. But I still think you're going to see massive overvaluations, you're going to see hype, you're going to see um, like an overheating of expectations, and you're going to see this sort of boom bust cycle again. Yeah. You expect that with STOs? Yes. Even though, because they can be more fairly valued, in a way it's harder for their value to go massively overpriced. Because if something's like an ICO, you don't know what it's valued. So I think that's one of the kind of the lead causes of what led to a ridiculous cycle. Because some of these projects were overvalued, 
but I couldn't accurately look at them and say that's the real price, so it's seven times overvalued. Whereas with an STO, because you can say that should be valued at 30 million, if it's valued at 150, you, you know inherently that it's overvalued. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that, like value, like the, the stock market doesn't like the stock market isn't at the price it's at. A stock isn't at the price it's at because that's what its fundamentals say to everyone. Yeah, it's just some people think it's higher than that, some people think it's lower than that, and it's the weighted average of what the trades are that day yeah. for that. So there isn't like but there's usually a tighter range, isn't there? Like you might have people talk about the uh, God, I can't remember the like the the trading multiple. I can't remember what it is. Uh, a certain multiple price of, earnings ratio. Yeah, that's the, yeah the PE ratio. Sure, but the price earnings ratio is different for different industries for different types of businesses. Like there's usually a roughly accepted range for each industry. So, like, uh, what's what's an accepted PE ratio for taxi companies, and does that apply to Uber? Like, the, so the, there's there's all this there's all this there's the, there's always going to be speculation. One of the fundamentally difficult things to do about valuating valuing startups. Mm -hmm. And even early stage businesses, is you don't know what the what the strip what the what the pathway is going to follow is. Mm -hmm. Like it could be exponent, it could be an exponent, it could be linear, it could be like it could just bumble around at the same level and like never really make any money. And a lot of that doesn't just come down to is the product good and is the market tasty. Like it also comes down to the team and their ability to execute. It also comes down to whether other competitors are going to come in. There's a great saying um, that I learned uh, in Y Combinator, which is um, uh, most companies die through suicide, not homicide. Yeah. I.e., most companies are killed because they do something wrong internally, nothing to do with a competitor coming in and eating their lunch and taking their business away from mm -hmm. them. So. The, the the there can still be massive overvaluations of, of, of equity companies and you see that all the time in the market like um, you see like you see some companies in Silicon Valley raising huge amounts of money and being justified for doing that but for every one of those there's equally lots of stories of companies raising huge amounts of money and doing nothing mm -hmm. and being complete failures absolutely so yeah I, I still think there will be a hype train for this as well. So I you think. think we're going to see another hype cycle with some maybe small to medium sized businesses moving onto the blockchain and then suddenly their valuation is going crazy? Right, yes. Because the because what people do, what most individual investors, um, what most uh, like non-sophisticated investors do is they go, I like the business, I want a piece of it. They don't go, is it a good price? Yes. They go. I like the business. I want to yeah. use of it, and so that's that's a that's really that's a really interesting dynamic that's going to continue and has happened in the past and will happen again in the future. Well, here's a good example to support your theory. I don't know if you know this. There was a company, it was Long Island Ice Tea or something like that. Changed their name to Long Island Blockchain. Yes. Long Blockchain Corp or something like yes. that. Yes. Went from ten million dollar valuation to sixty million dollar overnight. Yes. And they were not an ICO, they weren't even related to blockchain. Just throw the name in there and now you're suddenly worth more. Yes. So we could, we could see another trend like that. Absolutely. Okay, so what's your opinion on institutional money then? You think the STOs, some people say institutional money will trigger the next bull run. Some people say it's institutional, sorry, some people say STOs, some people say institutional money. Do you believe STOs because of institutional money? And what's kind of... Do you know what I mean by that? So do you think that SEOs are going to trigger a bull run because they allow institutions to get in? What's your take on it? Um, y yes, partly. I think that that's, I think that's, that's fundamentally the... Uh, like, like a lot of institutions are sort of like a bit cagey about the whole regulation thing. Because mm -hmm. like, if I'm investing in a company and I'm not sure that that company has done the thing that it's supposed to do in a regulatory compliant way and the institution... Uh, is worried because the SEC or the SCA, FS, FCA or whatever will come in and find them. Mm -hmm. It's a bad investment. Mm -hmm. So I think that I think that institutional money is is definitely going to come in as a result of the as as a result of the STO thing. I don't know if that will cause the bull run because generally speaking, as uh, institutions, uh, maybe that's being too fair to institutions. A lot of the time, you would hope that smart for it. Yeah, and you'd <laughs> hope that institutions don't don't make 
silly bets. Mm. Um, that's good. Look at twenty years ago, though. Yeah, we were doing just that. Yeah, for sure. And like everyone, everyone is capable of making silly bets because mm. like hindsight's twenty twenty, yeah. and you don't know, and you do need to make bets. Yeah, that's exactly what you're doing. Yeah. right? You have a diversified portfolio of bets, and the earlier the company, the more di- the, the more diversified those bets need to be. Mm. But you're hoping that one in twenty will do a hundred x return and make your make your fund right. Yeah. So, um, I, yeah, I think that the, the next bull run will come partly because of money flowing in, but I think that the institutions will help give credence to the market, which will mean that more consumer capital flows in as well. Yep. So, like, it will be the trigger. It will help trigger because there will be, like, money flowing in, and then, and then everyday people will do the same thing. Oh, I want a piece of that. Mm. That looks like a good bet because mm. the money is flowing and value is going up. Yeah, absolutely. And what do you think is in the way of institutions? I kind of view it as almost three ways. Uh, number one, they have to be told they can. So you have to have clear regulation. Like You're not going to have a pension fund buying Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies until they legally know everything has been clarified and they're safe to do so. Yeah. Number two, they have to have the ability to buy it. So yeah. like they're not going to go onto Coinbase and buy on Coinbase. You need something like maybe an ETF, maybe back. That's a contentious point. And number three, custody solutions. So they need to be able to hold it somewhere. Yeah. For me, there's those three barriers, two of which we're almost overcoming. Like Bitcoin, the SEC, I don't know if they've 100% clarified, but they've kind of indicated pretty clearly it's not a security. It's safe from that perspective. And uh, the storing it as well, we're seeing more and more custody solutions. So for me, the last big one is the ability to buy it, which is something like a Bitcoin ETF. Everyone thinks that could trigger a bull run because that could allow the institutions to get it. What do you think is holding them back? I mean, I, I would agree with all of your points. Um, I think that the uh, being told they can do it, I don't think pension funds are going to be buying this, these kind of instruments anytime soon. You don't think they buy? Yeah, like, I mean, pension like funds just one percent. I'm not talking about a large portion because that's that's a huge risk. But if you can. If you can reduce your risk while, increase, while increasing reward due to its lack of correlation, Bitcoin with other traditional assets, it could actually improve your overall portfolio. Yeah, so balanced portfolio management theory yeah. and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I just don't think that pension funds are that risk on, um, generally speaking. Like, mm. the pension funds have a mandate for long-term capital. Yeah. Um, preservation and growth um, I think that the kind of institutions you're going to see in next are going to be hedge funds and uh, prop shops mm-hmm. and um, you know sort of the bigger VCs and that kind of thing like that's that's the sort of institutional bent that you'll see next yeah uh, pension funds aren't going to be coming in until governments are issuing yeah, no, government bonds for sure. until governments are issuing government bonds on a, on DLT yeah yeah then sure pension funds will come in Okay. Um, but they don't—they don't need to be. They don't need to be the forerunners. Yeah, and they're certainly not. No, I, I don't see them coming first. Yeah, I'm not. I, I use them as an example just because they're the biggest. Yeah, I, I someday believe they're going to have one or two percent exposure to the market. They're never going to go ten percent. Nothing crazy as a pension fund, but just yet, yeah, like it's a new asset class. Potentially adding one or two percent can increase your performance while reducing your risk. That—that's a selling point to me. Uh, but yeah, so what do you think is kind of the barrier for institutions to get involved there? Um, I, I, I think I think it's what we were saying before, like just fundamentally not having a basis for valuation in things that are coming into the market, yeah. and like you can't do mark to market, you can't do re- you can't do reporting to your shareholders and to your to your like it's it's very it becomes very difficult to just know how to account for the thing and how to and what to how to treat it and mm-hmm. how to work out if you're getting a good deal. And I think that we should definitely separate the concept of an investor from the concept of a trader. Mm-hmm. I think that this market, crypto market, has been great for traders. Yes. High volatility, mm-hmm. fast markets, like and like things being built on. And you can do trading strategies on momentum trading, and like and and, and and just looking at how the markets are reacting in sentiment. But it's not value investing. Mm-hmm. It's not what we think of as long-term investment, where you have an institution that has a mandate for buying and holding. Mm-hmm. I think that that's that that's the difference that is needs to change for that real money to flow in. So we'll need potentially security tokens for that shift to occur. That's as well. for sure. 
And let's say, let's say right now we have security tokens, just right. hypothetically. Yeah. What would be the step after that then that the institutions would need? Or would, would that be it? Would I think that's it. I think, I think that, there's, that there are good custody solutions. Yeah. I think there are good uh, broker solutions that are coming in. Like I know of a number of brokers yeah. who are getting who are regulated and getting into the crypto space. Mm -hmm. So like the ability to buy through a regulated institution that will like do all the the, the, the required regulatory reporting and all that kind of stuff and will sell you crypto. Mm -hmm. That's being sorted. The ability to have custody solutions, like uh, I mean, Coinbase is 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 a, is a big one, but Coinbase um, custodial services, which is an arm of Coinbase, has a fully insured custodial solution over a certain amount that you're holding with them, and like that that's good enough, right? You, sure, if you're going to be holding a few billion dollars, then you might start, or a few hundreds of millions of dollars, then you might start going. Mm, it, what's the insurance underpinning that like? Where's that? Where's that offset? Like, what's the claiming process going to be? But for most people, for most institutions who are just looking to dip their two and put a few tens of millions in, yeah, that's probably good enough already. Okay, so you think we already have the ability? So actually, that's an interesting one then. So we don't need a Bitcoin ETF, you don't think? No. We just need the ability. We just need instead of utility tokens, the transition to security tokens. We need an asset type on DLT that institutions can understand mm -hmm. in a way that doesn't just, just, just fall so far out of their ballpark that it creates loads of problems. I've met institutional investors who can't get into crypto because it's not in their LP agreement. Mm -hmm. um, because it's not fundamentally something that um, they even envisage being an asset class. That's changing mm -hmm. where they're going back to their LPs and they're, and they're going to their LPs, hey, look at the market, wouldn't you like a piece of that? Let's change the agreement. Mm -hmm. It takes time. So there's all of that happening in the background as well. Um, but yeah, it, it's coming. Talking about the long term market, we kind of saw, so go back 20 years ago, and the biggest companies in the world obviously were not internet companies at the time. Fast forward 20 years, and we now have the fan companies and many other internet companies that are basically taken over because the technology was so game-changing. Do you believe we're gonna see another transition with blockchain? Could an infrastructure project someday be worth more than the, than the highest valued companies in the world? That's a really difficult question to answer yes. um, because it all depends on where the value capture mm -hmm. will occur. Um, there are Which brings in the fat protocol thesis. Yeah. It brings in the fat protocol thesis to some extent. But the thing is, is that that still doesn't guarantee that value capture is going to occur, even if that's where the data is stored. Because if you have, if you are needing to incentivize a decentralized system of node runners or miners that need to be given the fees for providing the resources to the network, Who's capturing the value? Is it the is it the protocol, or is it the people running the protocol? Mm -hmm. So, um, the question of whether or not there will be a protocol that is more valuable than any any other platform in the world will come down to whether or not the token of the platform is viewed as something of value. If, it, if, the, if the token of the underlying platform is able to be linked and become a store of value that people want to hold for the fact that it is a store of value, not just for its utility, mm -hmm. then yes, there is the possibility that a protocol that everyone relies on could fundamentally um, birth a global currency that becomes something that everyone can rely on as well. And then if it does that, it becomes a global currency, a supranational um, essentially safe haven that people can hold value in, inside of, mm -hmm. then yes, that will be the most valuable entity in the world. Mm -hmm. But that's a big if. Okay, that's an interesting point. That kind of relates as well to people's talk about Ether. How Ethereum could be successful and Ether may not have any value. Yes. What's, what's your take on that? Yeah, so like Ether, Ethereum very strongly at the, in the first day said, if Bitcoin is digital gold. Mm -hmm. Ethereum is digital oil. Mm -hmm. And oil is consumed. It's not it's not really like some might argue it's a store of value, but mm -hmm. most people would view yeah. 
Great well, to use it as, a, as a utility, right? right? It's something that I will burn to use. Mm -hmm. And I think that that very nature of Ethereum, the concept of it fundamentally just being to be able to use the system, and I have no other reason to hold it, and so all it is is working capital, mm -hmm. right? I, as a business, can buy Ethereum this quickly at this price, mm -hmm. and I can then use it this quickly at this price. And whatever that speed is, is how much Ethereum you'll ever need to hold. And that mm -hmm. could be a minute's worth of, it, worth of yeah. ETH. And in that case, if velocity is high mm -hmm. and holding is low, Ethereum will essentially have zero value. Because what will happen is I'll use it as long as I need it to value transfer to the miner. Yeah. Yep. And then the miner will you hold it mm -hmm. as long as it needs to value transfer out to receive the money that it uses for its for paying its mining rates yeah. and stuff like that. So uh, I think I think there's a very real possibility of that happening. Mm -hmm. But I also think there's a very real possibility of Ethereum not being useful because fundamentally it's it's blockchain is proven time and time again not to be scalable ethereum is proven time and time not to be scalable and its most recent announcements around casper and serenity and all this kind of stuff is just pushing a timeline out so far that it is at very real risk of just being becoming redundant being overtaken okay uh we're going to wrap up with the final couple of questions because i know you're very busy and probably need to get off if people would like to learn more about radix where should they go? Um, yeah, so if they want to learn more about Radix uh, and how we've built you know, a fundamentally scalable platform that can allow every single person, every single device in the world to use it simultaneously, um, go to www.radixdlt.com. Uh, that's R-A-D-I-X-D-L-T.com, um, where you can find out uh, all about our platform. Um, you can also download our wallet and play around with it. You can play around on the test net. There's also our developer toolkit so that you can start building on top of it. Uh, and also our white papers if you want to jump into the technology itself. Okay, and the final question. If you could like leave the audience with a final message. It could be about cryptocurrencies, blockchain, life in general. You could say anything you like. What would you like to say? Um, I'd like to say uh, something actually I said before. Um, uh, when when I was on a panel recently, where someone asked me, "Where are we in the in the in the life cycle of the internet?" Mm -hmm. If we were going to compare where we were in the life cycle of the internet to um, to where we are in the life cycle of the blockchain, which is that a lot of people are saying, "Oh, we're 1993, 1994." Um, think about don't think about DLT and blockchain just as what it can fundamentally do with the, the ways that we use technology today. But think about how it might change the way that we interact as a society. Like we were talking about earlier how, how a lot of public DLTs and crypto in general are exercises in public governance. Mm -hmm. Now what you get is this ability to collect, to have collective val collected value around a collective goal. Right? So you can you can you can create these programmatic structures that can hold value and then spend value on behalf of the community, where a community buys into that goal. And fundamentally, that looks like, when taken large, like a government, like a country. And so I think that what's going to change over the long run with this technology is not just things like, oh, it's easier for me to send money, mm -hmm. oh, it's easier for me to buy insurance. It's going to be the very concept of statehood, the very concept of sovereignty is going to adjust as a result of this technology. So people talk about where are we in this in this time frame. And I'd say that we're not even at the start of the internet when you think about what the impact DLT and blockchain is long term gonna have with 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 society. Mm -hmm. And so like a lot of people are in this rush to like rush in and, and like it's, if we don't do something like tomorrow, it's going to, it's going to, like, it's all going to, all the opportunities going to go. I'd say, like, just take a breath. Mm -hmm. This is, this is not, this is not a sprint. It is a marathon. And like, if you want to be involved in in blockchain, if you want to be involved in DLT, if you want to be building things and getting involved, think really carefully and deeply about this space and like take some time because there is so much opportunity here. And it's going to fundamentally change the way that societies are built and operate. Mm -hmm. And that's really exciting, but it, it, there, is, there is still time to reflect and, and, and be intelligent and 
and um, cognitive about how you're interacting with the industry mm -hmm. because I think that we're just at the start. Yeah, well, exactly. We're so early. So many people talk about missing the boat. Yes. Because they talk about you could buy, you could have bought Bitcoin for $5 in yes. one day. Yes. Yeah, but what about when you look forward so people look back at this time yes. and say they missed the boat because they weren't here now? Yes. No, exactly. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. That was fascinating. It's great to have you. Thank you. It's great to have you. Great. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And that is the end of the interview. I'd like to say a big thank you to Pierce. He's a genuinely lovely, humble guy. I can't speak highly enough of him. And he gave up his valuable time to basically let me interview him without even talking about his project. So a big, big thank you to him. I hope that you guys have learned a lot from him as I did throughout the interview. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to see more content like this, remember to subscribe and give the video a like. From Tom here at Crypto Gurus, thank you for watching. We will speak again very soon.